hi everyone. Um, so this, I can assure you, will not be a conventional presentation. Um, I'm just generally a pretty excited person. I love the stuff that we're talking about tonight. My plan is really to, um, to tell some stories and talk through some experiences that we've sort of leveraged with social, some great case studies on what people are doing well. And then hopefully, if we want to talk intricacies of different platforms, opportunities, risks, that stuff, we can do a lot of that in, in a question and answer format. So it's probably an easy way to do it. Um, before I start, so I know I'm wearing a t-shirt. Like I said, this is not a conventional, boring presentation, hopefully. Those of you who are just here for the points, like hopefully I can make you smile. If that, if that happens, that's awesome. Um, I want to start by doing one thing really, really quickly. We just talked about um, the fact that we're filming. I want to get a selfie with you guys. So I'm going to do this, and I want a bunch of you to put your hands in the air and at least pretend something interesting is happening. Like, someone, go, anyone, go. Sweet, thank you. Thank you for participating in my stupid activities. So, um, basically today, like I said, um, I wanted to set the scene. I'm a marketing consultant. Um, I work with brands locally here in Brisbane and also overseas, and we help them make the most of social platforms, make the most of Facebook, make the most of Twitter, make the most of YouTube. But then we also like to go a bit further than that and use platforms like Instagram and Pinterest. And even further afield from there, platforms like We Heart It, which my guess is most people here won't have heard of. It's really an emerging platform in the US. So. That's what we do, and I'm very heavily driven around marketing, around brand, around scaling your voice. I'm not so driven by risk, by problems, by challenges, as much as those things are crucial to us, and we don't do anything without having a corporate objective. The, the big thing for me is lean iterative strategy where we learn a lot, and you know, of the 10 micro strategies that we roll out, the three that work, we leverage, we extrapolate, and we push harder with the ones that we know we work through testing. So we do a lot of off-brand strategy, right? We try to reduce risk for brand by doing things that aren't branded at all, test and learn with strategy, and then iterate and put it under a corporate brand later on. So, that's probably a, a, good, a good way to set the scene from my perspective. Um, my question for you guys is, how many people here sort of work for their own practice, own their own practice, work in private practice? Next to none, okay. How many of you work for a large organisation? How many of you work for government? Awesome. That's, I guess that's a large organisation. Um, cool. So that's given me a good, a good understanding here. So a lot of this stuff really applies when you do run your own business, which isn't that useful for you guys, unfortunately. But what we'll do is we'll talk a lot about personal brand, because I believe personal brand is a way to build massive thought leadership in your own space, in your sector. And I believe that when you do build a strong personal brand, you've got this opportunity to create endless, endless, like ridiculous opportunities in the future. I'll talk about some really interesting people that have done that in this presentation. Um, this is just something that was sort of centred around the financial planning industry, and this is about independent financial advisors. But I, this was literally um, some some results of some surveys that came out literally last week, and um, and essentially what Beaton Research, in collaboration with Zurich, found out was that uh, there's been this 80% increase in financial advisors. I know it's different, but bear with me. Um, using Twitter, which has risen 10.3% uh, from sorry from 10.3% of respondents to 18 in the past two years. Okay, like cool, they're using Twitter, that's interesting. A lot of us use Twitter, probably half people in this room, a third of people, a quarter of people in this room use Twitter, hopefully. Some have tried to use Twitter and have an account. Um, um, but what was interesting to me was almost 25% of respondents were unable to estimate the proportion of their client base using social media. So, okay, so what you're telling me is that people are trying to use it, but no one can talk about their clients. So it's not really led with a business objective, except we're, we're hearing that we should be on Twitter, or we should be using social media, or we should be active in these places. But the scary thing, or the truth is, that like, we don't know how many of our clients are, and we don't know how we're talking to our clients. So I guess it's a hobby, right? It's not really a business objective. Let's go back a step. I use social platforms because they're a way to reach people. So I actually don't care about what platform I use, right? It all comes down to who I'm trying to talk to. And the way we do that is we do that with content, right? So it really comes down to content marketing. That's what it is. It's how do I tell my story in a way that's interesting? So here are three dumb things I've done and three ridiculous results that I've gotten from that. Literally found out there was a world record called the world's longest high five, where two guys in Canada stood two kilometers apart, arms in the air, camera crew on each, ran in the middle and high fived, and it got written about by all these major publications. I was like, I can beat that. Let's find out how you beat a world record. How do you set a world record? Like all these people are talking about it. That's stupid. It's not even that far. It's like two kilometers. So a friend and I literally like put on short shorts and ran 4.5 kilometers, and we literally got written about by, as was mentioned, the Huffington Post, by Bloomberg, Business Week for breaking a stupid high five. The, the best 
quote in the world that, that I've read ever was um, something in this article to the effect of never has tension been higher since it was since the last Commonwealth Games have tensions been higher between Australia and Canada after we took that. So that's a little claim to fame of mine, which I'm super proud of. This is called the Living Outrageously podcast. I talk like this probably faster and with more energy to this guy here who is actually way more energetic than he looks in that photo there. Um, and what we do is we just talk about lifestyle design, about entrepreneurship, about business, about marketing, about whatever we're thinking about. We release those every single week. That got blasted to the top of the health charts in iTunes. I guess entrepreneurship is a health issue or something. So that's where we were categorized. But that resulted in big spike of downloads. That's what generated a community for us, right? The value of social comes down to community. The way we got community is through content. And then finally, I wrote a book which did pretty well. Um, it's, we don't have to talk about that. That's actually pretty boring. So let's move on. This guy's name is Michael Birch. I'm going to tell you why Michael Birch is important in a second. In 2005, Michael Birch and his wife built a social network called Bebo. Does anyone remember Bebo? Sweet, I do have someone that does, that's cool. It was big in the MySpace days, big competitor of MySpace. In 2008, he sold it for just under a billion dollars to AOL, America Online. Now, what happens when you sell a social network for a billion dollars, right? The assets get shifted, the community gets shifted, whatever. What does AOL do to tech companies? It drills them into the ground and they explode in a fiery mess. So, in 2013, when I was working for this guy in Silicon Valley, we actually bought Bebo back for $1 million. So there's your return, right? Like we sold it for 850 million and we bought it back for 1 million. Um, and the reason why it didn't work, the only reason why it didn't work was because AOL didn't know how to look after the community. They didn't know how to enable the interaction, the conversations. They didn't know how to get brands engaged. And the, 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 the platform was still there. The people were long gone. They're on Facebook, on Snapchat and on everything else. So that's probably like the high level is when, when it comes down to social networking, to social media, it doesn't matter like, like what, what you do, it doesn't matter what platforms you choose. What, it matters, what really matters is who you talk to and how you talk to them and why you talk to them and why they should care about what you have to say. That is literally all that matters. And if you can't nail that, then you can't expect anyone to care, to listen, to engage with you. It doesn't make sense. But when it comes to personal brand, and I believe that personal brand is massive. In 2015, right, there is a massive opportunity for people in this room, for people anywhere, to position themselves as ex experts in their field and gain recognition if they choose to have it, right, in thought leadership and reputation building. You, you position yourself well if you choose to, and no one has to do this, right? You don't have to. I'm sure that you can continue on as you are, but the people who choose to and they want that, that's, this is where the opportunity is. It's in content. And why does it matter? Well, this is one of our clients' brands. You'll notice that you actually don't see a brand name anywhere. This is on Instagram, and it's an account we've been running for literally a couple of weeks. Um, it's got 1,000 followers. That's nothing big. But this is a major retailer in the space, where you can probably almost guess who they are, um, where they care about camping, they care about exploring, they care about the outdoors. And for them, they're looking at social media and going, we don't really know what to do. We've got some stuff happening and people care, kind of. So we were like, all right, like you're sensitive to social media. You don't know what you want to do. Let's not go and splash your brand out everywhere and let's not go and tell everyone about it. Let's literally go in softly and go, okay, let's do a content play. Let's make, let's make sure people care about like, what you stand for. The opportunity for them is that now they're sh on this account, they're sharing new products that they want to go and roll out nationally and en engaging how impactful the, the, their, their community or their consumers are going to grab that one versus that one. And this has been massive for them. So this isn't about, for them, this isn't about a massive consumer play where they're going to build this huge audience of millions of people and blah, blah, blah. It's about like, understanding people. That's when Instagram was a massive tool for them and it still it remains to be. This is a Brisbane-based technology startup and the reason why I love them, it's called Zova, it's an iPhone app, download to your phone, it's fitness, it's, um, it's sort of got this really interesting algorithm to tie music with exercises and to the beat and all this stuff, it's cool. Um, what they did was, before launching, they had an Instagram account where for the six months prior to launch, they were taking the content from the app making still images like this, talking through simple stretches. There's some further down where they talk about literally like step-by-step -step exercises. The value of that for them, 10,000 loyal fans before they even make the app public. What happens then? You've got this ambassador base. So now they've literally got different people who are positioned as ambassadors who've come in and actually created content for them. That was powerful. That's not your conventional social media strategy, right? That was, we're going to need users. How can we get users? Well, let's think about the value that we add. We've got all this content. We, can, we want to motivate people with our app. Let's make them care. Let's show them. So that is essentially what they did. 
And I was talking to an insurance company literally three weeks ago and talking through some examples and some of the big retail stuff brands were doing and they literally said to me, the market, head of marketing literally said, but Matt, we're boring, no one cares. Literally no one cares about what, I, what we say, no one's paying attention, they've got to come to us, necessary evil was the actual phrase they used. And I was like, okay, I get that, like you have to be engaged in some capacity, but, um, but you don't <coughs> want to take, it, take a step forward, right? That's cool, whatever. Has anyone heard of blend tech? It's a blender. Blenders are not that interesting. If you're a massive foodie, they're kind of interesting. But let's face it, it's just it's a high-end blender. And blend tech aren't, like you, you might have seen Nutribullet, right? That's all over the infomercials right now. I'm seeing nods, this is awesome, right? So these guys have been smart, right? They're like, let's go do crazy infomercials. Let's like, let's try and blow this up big, right? And this is the hot thing to have in the, if you're on the smoothie diets and whatever, it's popular, right? But what they don't have is this guy. This is the CEO of Blendtec. It's a horrible photo. But he's the CEO of Blendtec. And I'll tell you what he did. So one day he was standing in their offices and he was standing in a dark room, literally in a dark room, blending a piece of wood. And the head of marketing walked past him and he was like, what are you, what? Why are you doing this? This is insane. It's a dark room, standing there, wearing a lab coat, blending a piece of wood. And he's like, this is how we test for quality. Like, how else would we do it, right? This is like early in days of the company. We don't have big R&D labs. The marketing manager goes, okay, this is interesting. Crazy guy is blending a piece of wood in a dark room in our office. How do we tell this story? Does anyone, does anyone know where this is going? All right, so I'm gonna show you something crazy. Hopefully this blows minds. This is where they're at now. Will it blend? That is the question. It's time for me to buy a new phone, and I always have to have the latest, but Samsung claims to be the greatest. The iPhone 5 has the A6 chip and retina display. The Galaxy S3 has a bigger screen and S-beam technology. The real question is, which one will blend faster in a Blendtec Total Blender? I'm gonna press the starting bell button. smoke. Don't breathe this. <laughs> oh, this smells like jelly beans. They both look the same to me. I think the real winner is the Blendtec Total Blender. Why don't you decide? All right, so for context, that video has been viewed 8.5 million times but it's not just that video that has been viewed 8.5 million times. He's done this for a thousand different products, right? Every single week for a crazy period of time, they were pumping these out. Then they started doing these crazy business development deals with popular car manufacturers and blending entire pieces of cars in the blender by ripping them off and cutting them up and whatever, right? It was interesting, it's fun, it's a great way to create some public perception and increase awareness around the brand, but this was where it got interesting. 100 million plus views on YouTube, 700,000 YouTube subscribers, for a blender, boring, right? 34th most subscribed channel on YouTube. Like we're talking about Red Bull, we're talking about like <coughs> GoPro, these are massive consumer brands and a blender is the 34th most subscribed. But most interesting was an 800% increase in revenue as a direct result of these campaigns over the following years. That is a boring product done well with social. This is a guy here, has anyone heard of Michael Yardney? He's, a, um, he's an influencer in the um, sort of property market investment sort of segment. And he's based literally down in um, Melbourne. There you go. Um, he owns a website called propertyupdate.com. Traditionally, boring concept, right? But he does have 34,000 legitimate followers on Twitter who actually care about his market analysis. 
So he's got his website, propertyupdate.com.au, where he's literally blogging every single day about trends, about what's going on. What was interesting here, is anyone a block fan? The fan of the block? There you go. That was him commenting on why the, the, the huge variances in the options as they came out the following day. So he's been really good at grabbing onto trends and going, let's create some content around this because that's what matters, right? People care about content. And he's done this phenomenal job of then monetizing that. So he can scale far beyond direct consulting to a client because now he's creating literally his own books and products around his space. Boring concept, traditionally boring, right? I don't want to sit there and talk about like the market updates and property necessarily. Some of you might, I don't know. I'm not a massive fan. Um, but he's done an amazing job of repositioning himself in a market as a thought leader, which I love. Um, and it's all good and well to talk about the crazy examples, right? The, the, the example of the, the, the crazy outdoor brand, the fitness app, they're pretty sexy topics that people are really passionate about. Then there's also a, right, a blender, market updates in property. But the reality is it's actually a very, very simple process that you go through to work out how can I make who I am or what I do or whatever it is that we're involved in scale. But this is literally all it comes down to for me. And yeah, there's processes and frameworks that sit below these, but content plus distribution equals community, the end, right? If you nail the right content, and that's not as simple as like, let's go and post a blog and we've got a new employee starting, so let's just post a blog about the new employee. Probably not gonna get 30, you're not gonna get 34th most subscribed YouTube channel on the internet with that. But I'll tell you what, with the right content in your space, it's not hard to build awareness and to build insight and to get people's attention on you. Distribution, how do you get that content in front of the right people, the people who actually care about it, right? That's not easy to do. That's actually really, really hard to do. So let's focus now on how do we do that, right? Well, let's use social platforms because they're all there. And we know, I can tell you, that the 34 to 50 female age demographic is rapidly increasing on Pinterest right now in terms of market saturation. And I know that I can literally go to Pinterest today and through some connections, do some direct targeted ads to those people right now. Okay, so all I've got to do is put the right message in front of those people and equals community. It's pretty simple stuff. We do it constantly. Um, when I was talking to John about doing this presentation, he literally said to me, like, can we talk about the conversation prism? And um, when I first, like, when I sort of, sort of thought about how we apply this, I was like, we should talk about it because this does give you an understanding of the landscape, but the truth is this is a, probably a quite a scary, complex look at it. Social isn't limited to a platform. Social media is not using Facebook or posting on a Facebook page or having a Twitter account. There are elements of social, but social is just people, right? It's where people spend their time. So when it comes to what you want to do, you can literally dive into any number. I would encourage anyone who's interested to look this up. I'll start to look at some of the platforms under each because that's where this becomes interesting, right? Like social marketplace, like, it, like who is aware of, I'll give you a couple here, um, Etsy, awesome. Who is aware of Airbnb? Hopefully a few more. Awesome. These are platforms that have Im embedded social at, their, at the core, right? So people interacting, call it collaborative economy, call it whatever you like, but it's people who are using social as a way to directly monetize what they do and who they are. There, this is a pretty fascinating way to look at it, but the big thing I would remember is that social isn't posting on Facebook. Right? It's a part of social, but if you're actually are developing a social strategy, you've got to be aware of what's, what's going on in the market and be listening. Right? This is, that's where this helps. You've got to be able to essentially be able to learn, right? So what platforms are there out right now that other people are already conversing on that I want to be a part of? And in, in this space, if you're actually interested in seeing what market leaders are doing, LinkedIn and Twitter are two obvious ones. If you are just searching for existing content and trying to learn, people are pumping content out there every single day here in Brisbane in their sectors. Right? It's just an interesting way of, of working. The risks. Um, this is another big one that everyone sort of defaults to. I mentioned at the start, I'm not a big fan of the risks conversation, but you actually need to think about this when you're embarking on any social <coughs> campaign. The truth is, if you're looking internally within an organisation, there's some obvious ones, right? If you're running your own, say, you're running your own practice and um, you've got a whole bunch of clients, adding clients on your personal Facebook page, as close as you are, can often be a risk, right? Because next thing, they're posting comments on your wall about their tax return, and that's not ideal, right? It's very public and it, confidentiality does become an issue there. Um, copyright, this is a big thing in content marketing right now. So even if you've got your own blog on your own website or you're blogging for a brand or you're blogging for an institution or whatever it is, right? You, you can't just go and write an article and then grab a photo off Google and throw that photo into your blog post, right? Most people do it even with credit, but it's, it's such a gray area that copyright does become an issue. So it becomes aware of who owns what and how do I credit or how do I buy rights to content? Something that needs to be thought about before you embark on any of these strategies. 
Okay, consider your LinkedIn and Twitter public. So even if you have your LinkedIn profile as private right now, I would think that anyone who wants to see it can find it. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was browsing LinkedIn just a couple of days ago, trying to find a contact within a certain company that we were reaching out to. And um, I assume everyone here has got a LinkedIn profile, most of you will. Cool. Um, searched in LinkedIn, okay, found, and you would have seen this before, right? First name and then last initial. I was like, oh, that's weird. Like, obviously they've got privacy settings set up in a way that doesn't enable me to see that. Went to Google typed in their job title and their first name, clicked through Google, what did it give me? Their full name, right? I don't know why it does that, but it does it, right? So the, the reality is I would think anything that you put onto a social network publicly, consider it to be public. Think that it's gonna be public. Think that if you post a status update on LinkedIn and anyone engages in it, people that they are, their second connections are gonna see that content. It's just the nature of the game. Um, I've got here, keep your team in the loop about what is and isn't acceptable, especially if something could be construed as advice. This is a messy space. Financial services industry has been just like bashed on this from big sort of like corporate marketing organisations where they're saying like everyone's putting huge disclaimers in their Twitter profiles where they've got 140 characters to play with because they're so scared and it's fair. You should actually be concerned. You shouldn't be posting what could be construed as advice. But I, I, I look at this and I go, right, know what isn't, isn't acceptable. Know when you should share something, know when you should have a disclaimer on it. Um, but the biggest risk, and I actually mean this wholeheartedly, the biggest, most extreme risk is that no one cares. So is that when you post content, no one pays attention, that no one engages, that no one does anything. And what a lot of organisations are doing right now is they're just continually posting because it's a numbers game and it's that we've got to get a lot more out and people will care if they see more of it, right? It's like, unfortunately, that's not really how it works. You do have, it is, a, it is a numbers game in terms of volume of content over time, but the reality is if no one's engaging, then you're not going to win any wars, right? No one's going to come to you and go, this is awesome. You're like doing all this stuff. No one cares. No one cares. That's just the reality. So the biggest part of any social campaign is that if you know no one cares, adapt the strategy, tweak the strategy. You know, if I post an update on my LinkedIn profile tomorrow celebrating something that the department that I worked in just did and some cool campaign or some cool press on it, right, I could do that. And if I get four likes on that post, then you know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to go, okay, four people of my ex thousands of connections have engaged in that post. It's not great. Some wouldn't have seen it, but still it's not great. Here's what I'm going to do. The next day I'm going to go on LinkedIn and use the new blogging platform built within LinkedIn and I'm going to write an article in there about what we did and link to the article through there. Because right now, if you're paying attention to social networks and to LinkedIn, you'd know that you actually get a notification when somebody does a LinkedIn blog at the moment, right? Someone that you're connected to. Simple way to get a lot more reach. So I would be thinking about how I can iterate through my own personal social media strategy, even if it was literally me browsing other people's profiles or their content. Here's a few things that I would, that I would do if I was starting from a zero base, I had a few accounts set up and I had nothing else and I wanted to build thought leadership in my sector, right? First of all, identify an objective. That makes sense. And with anything that you do, question, does this meet our objective? So if, I'm, if I want to get a more followers on Twitter, right, if that was my objective, it's not a great objective, but if that was my objective, right, anything that I post, I should be able to ask myself, why would someone engage in this content? Why would someone follow me or retweet or favorite this content? Because if they're not gonna do that, I'm not gonna get any more followers, am I? No one's gonna discover it. No one's gonna care because it's not being shared. So understand what your initial objective is, and that can be iterative, right? That doesn't have to be set in stone. So that's important. Another one is create content for your existing audience, and that could be internal, right? So it's how are you telling the story of what you do, right, to your peers, to your, to your direct customers or your direct audience, right? Because you don't have to go with this big, crazy, elaborate social strategy when you're first starting out and go and start pumping out blogs on a, on a corporate website. Not necessary at all. So my theory with all of this is, like, think about who actually cares, who's engaged. If you've got a mailing list that you currently communicate with, test different content types with them. If you have the flexibility or the opportunity to create some video content like we're doing right now, that's amazing, right? Like, do that and try throwing that in your next piece of email marketing. Like, why wouldn't you do that? It's not expensive to do. It's becoming far more easy, far more achievable. So be experimenting, but be create with your existing audience because that's a great base to play with, right? And when you know something's working with them, then you realise it's probably going to extend beyond this. Or if people, better still, are sharing your EDM or your, your email content or your whatever, if people are sharing that, forwarding to a friend because there's something relevant in there, there's lessons to be learned, right? Okay, that's interesting. That was relevant to someone. Um, the next point this is something that anyone could do, and probably no one will, but I hope that someone, someone shoots me an email later and says they did, is write an article. 
on, on something, right? And keep it aligned to your personal brand. So don't call out your, your employer, right? Well, in most cases, you will still be able to write a blog article, even if you are employed by someone, as long as you're not directly talking about <coughs> like a project that you worked on, the intricacies, right? Write something in your area of expertise or an industry, industry trend or something that's relevant and keep it short and simple. It not, doesn't have to be this big, elaborate, complex strategy. Um, play with the platforms. So we looked at the conversation prism on the previous slide. I would literally jump on Twitter. I would, I mean, you'd probably most of you on Facebook, right? You know how Facebook works. I would jump on Pinterest maybe, and I would just play with it as a consumer and follow other brands or follow other influencers and see what they're doing and engage with them directly because it's just another awesome way to build your own audience. But first, see how they're doing it. It's, it's so simple, right? Like, as a, just as an example, I run, I go to search.twitter.com every single day and I run searches for social media marketing targeting, and you can literally do this, targeting people within 50 kilometers of the Brisbane CBD. Because guess what? There are a lot of people talking about social media marketing and there's a lot of people asking questions about it. So for me on my walk into the office to jump on my phone and run that quick search and see 10 different people I can like literally give, add some value to in that conversation trail, it's massive for me, right? It's an amazing opportunity to talk directly to people who are having a problem or a challenge or whatever it is. So um, that's a big thing is, 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 is just start playing with it. Just start running searches. Just start looking at what other people are doing. I mentioned Twitter. Twitter's actually a great one for um, engaging others in the industry because there are going to be a lot of people who do things like you who are active on Twitter. They're, they are everywhere. There's people across the board talking about their industry right now. And it's an amazing way to build established thought leadership in your space. If all you did was open a Twitter account, fill out the little bio and go and follow a bunch of people in your industry, you're going to start to see other people following you back. Because you're going to be, oh, that's interesting. Such and such is now on Twitter and they work in a space that is parallel to me or relevant to me. Next thing, right, day, three days, five days later, you might see they posted a link to an article that's actually really interesting. And you might respond back with, their, with your thoughts, right? It's, it's a great way to start to build the, the online network in parallel to you know, your physical real world network that you, that you meet with people every other day. So that's interesting. And also the other thing I had here was targeted advertising. Um, it probably doesn't apply to a lot of you guys, but th it has never ever been easier to run targeted ads at people. You've all seen targeted ads, right? You've probably seen remarketing efforts where there's the same ad following you all around the web, right? And then next thing you're gonna look up a, a pair of shoes on Amazon and next thing in your Facebook feed is a photo of those shoes. And you're like, that's pretty creepy, right? Like, like it's actually not hard to run these run these tests, and we do it, we, we do this stuff every day because it's such a simple way to get a message in front of an audience. So, um, like, and, and it's it's experimental too, right? You don't have to go and put a thousand dollars into it. We we put ten dollars into some pieces of content and just see if they're going to get reach, if they're going to get scale. If they do, awesome. Let's push that to more social platforms. If they're not, okay, that that one didn't work, right? We, we handed it to an audience and they didn't care. So let's play with the copy. Let's play with the imagery. Let's tweak it a little bit because it's still good content. And I had one bonus quick tip here for anyone who is interested in blogging for their brand. Um, HubSpot is an awesome B2B platform. I get nothing for saying that, but it's an awesome tool for, for marketing. But they've got this really cool free online tool where it's literally the blog topic generator. So you enter in literally three phases just around what you're interested in and you hit give me blog topics and it just fires back a few of these. I, we actually use this for, a, for brain, as a brainstorming tool within our own team, because we go, great, we've got a client who um, is a lo big logistics company, right? And they're trying to build um, blog content in their space because people care or are interested in or whatever in their industry about this stuff. So it's like, let's enter in commercial driving or let's enter in removalists or let's enter in whatever and get ideas like this. And next thing, we're all brainstorming, like, well, actually, what tools are there? What online tools are there for people in this space to meet others who are doing it, right? Let's write about that or whatever. So it's just a cool platform. It's HubSpot's online uh, blog topic generator. So I'm just a fan of that because it's interesting or relevant or whatever. And that was the end of my stories and whatever. So thanks. Do you want to have a chat? Yeah. Um, we're happy to take some questions. Uh, mm. Otherwise, we're just going to have a few questions to, um, to, to Matt at the moment, based on some of my experiences. Um, I can't guarantee you'll be as energetic as Matt. <laughs> you shouldn't try. people down there. You're up. <laughs> uh, any questions first? Tell me how far off I was and how not relevant this was to you. Someone. No? All right. Too shy. Oh, good. Terry. I have a question, but as a, with a display of the dinosaur, I read a, um, an article a couple of months ago, and in the context of a political campaign, it essentially the same thing, the more sort of ragged and, and, and sort of right. feral the comments became, the more and more just to a small, small group. Yeah. And then backed a very boring uh, traditional media yep. with very repetitive messages. So 
show you classic Sunday night advertisement of you know naming exactly what it was going to be were the things that probably worked the best right. in that context. But really, I'm just looked, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, no, totally, totally. There's, there's always like occasions where the message doesn't cut through or people don't gravitate to it as much as you expect that they might, right? I've seen some interest. I don't, I don't know the exact sort of environment around that example, but I can talk to a political campaign. I don't even know where it was run, but I was reading about this not long ago, where the the messaging that was pushed via social platforms to audiences, right, was what you would see on a sign as you're driving down the road. So it was literally the big elaborate image and that was pushed to everyone. And I actually don't believe that's ever going to get cut through, right? I don't think anyone's ever going to care about that because it's just more noise in the feed in the same way that it's noise when you're driving down the road. And some people probably make decisions based on that, but I think most don't. Um, an interesting example, does anyone know Andrew Lamming? He's a member for Bowman down on the south side. Um, he, he stands by the fact that social changed his last campaign. He won by some crazy, crazy number. I don't know what it was. Um, and on, on, on the, the previous term, it was a significantly diff, like, like significantly wider margin. And um, he's currently, I think he's the most followed politician in Australia. Um, he has the most engaged audience, but he's posting, it's just interesting more than anything, he's posting several times a day on local issues, challenges, whatever, and getting literally hundreds of comments from people in the local area about that problem. Like, right down to that roundabout is hard to navigate because the hedges are too high. Right, right through to stuff at the other spectrum, which is like more philosophical land rights or, or whatever. So it's just, it's just interesting that, um, that it can go in a number of ways. I don't think there's a, a right or wrong approach. I think if you... Yeah. Then just spend it spraying. It's like, it's like you, can, you can hold a banner in front of anyone, right? And social is really just another way to do that. And if you put a bad message in front of people, it's not going to resonate. So my theory would be, you know, there's, there's room for people to do it right. Um, I don't know if it's been done yet, right, to be honest. But there's a, it's an interesting space. Thank you. Be interesting if you have any, anyone who had more, more followers than Malcolm Turnbull or Kevin Rudd. So that's right, that's right. <laughs> Mm. Um, just an example, I guess, uh, Matt, of, uh, I listen to the, one of the Sydney radio stations quite, uh, I won't say who, who they are publicly, but it's more interesting than a lot of the, the Brisbane different radio, a bit more controversial, I should say. And uh, they talk about the, uh, the Sydney town centre suddenly becoming very um, uh, anti-car. There's, there's shutting down streets and a lot of uh, controversy, making it bike friendly. And they said there's a lot of buzz, positive buzz on social media about this. But they analysed the, the traditional media and they analysed the social media. And social media, the buzz was from cyclists and people who were <coughs> positive about that approach. And yet it was affecting the business community rather mm. rather severely, which was more uh, voiced in the traditional press. Mm. So maybe that's affecting Terry's um, uh, comment. So mm. I just want to comment on, on the, on the yeah. comparative effectiveness. I mean, the reality is, like, I, I just look at all these as, as distribution platforms. The ones that people who really care can go to social and write an essay and put it in front of people. So you'll often get, like, in the politi political example, right, like, you're going to get the, the ones who are super passionate about something, who are going to go out there and spray their voice out there. But the majority of people aren't paying attention to that, let's face it, right? Like, because they're watching TV or they're, not, they're certainly not browsing, you know, the, the Labor Facebook page or the Liberal Facebook page. They're sitting back going, like, when's this stuff going to be over? I want to watch the block. So, and, and as long as that's sort of people's general attitude towards it, I think it's just another way to communicate. The ones who care will pay attention, the ones who don't, mm. well, they'll see it through traditional media and whatever, and they'll have a, a, a response as a result of that, but I don't think it's going to change anything. Right. It's interesting. Some of the conversations Matt and I've had before is that um, some of my, my colleagues in the sales industry buy, used to buy uh, likes or buy people. Um, and Matt had an interesting take on that and how the Google algorithm has changed significantly to actually uh, discourage that. Just want to comment on. Yeah, so um, how many of you are administrators for an existing like, corporate Facebook page, a branded page? Just one couple, awesome. So um, what's interesting is that traditionally when people had their branded business page, ABC Consulting Services, and they had a thousand fans on that page and they published a piece of content 18 months ago, that content would have been seen by maybe like 500 people, 600 people, 700 people. The majority of the people who had subscribed for their content would see it. Um, what Facebook has done over time is they've said, well, actually, we want to show more advertising to people. We want to show less organic content. So we're going to choose how many of your followers will see your content. Okay, so unless you want to put money into ads, you're not going to get that. Now let's now let's throw it into this discussion because there's a whole other element to this, and that's that. 
brands with an engaged audience, right, who Facebook deem to have engaging content, right, will get more reach. So now it's like, I might, I might have a thousand like, followers or fans or likes on my page, you might have a thousand, but when I do a post, 700 people see my content, when you do it, 40 do. And it's because my fans or my audience is more engaged and Facebook will recognise that. Here's what was happening. People were going, oh wow, I can get 3,000 likes on my Facebook page for five bucks. That's crazy, like how good will I look when I'm chatting to my mates over a barbecue and I'm like, check out how popular my business is, right? It doesn't matter that they're bots or they're fake accounts or they're in the Middle East somewhere, no, I don't care, it doesn't matter, right? I've got this big audience that I can now wave around to everyone and go look at me. And, um, and think about that engagement stat, right? If I've bought 5,000 and you've bought 1,000, but Facebook are looking how engaged our fans are, and mine are literally nothing, right? I'm gonna get massively penalized on my organic reach. So anyone who was buying fans is now, in the last three to six months, been hugely penalized for it, massively. I know, do you wanna to talk to the example, like, like have you seen a drop in organic reach on the page that you work on? Oh, totally, totally, it's massive. So there's, now there's a bunch of different ways to validate effectiveness or, or how engaged or how relevant <coughs> they are. What a lot of brands are doing at the moment is they're going, and there's just an example, sort of tangent, but example is um, you can sort of do advertising with Facebook's custom audiences. So you can be like, here is an, ex an extract of all of my current customers. I wanna show some message to, messaging to them through Facebook. There's a thousand people on this, in this spreadsheet. You throw that into Facebook and they'll literally show an ad just to those people. So it's just a great way to re-engage or to re-recognize. Um, there's a bunch of export tools that you can do this. Um, like, it makes sense to do it because you kind of want to know what percentage of these people, in the case of a, of a not-for-profit, have donated or engaged once, multiple times, and go, like, how many of these people actually care? Or why are these people here, right? So the ones who haven't, who've never engaged with us before based on our database, like, what do they care about? And, and what content are they engaging in, right? Because if they're engaging in, like, a lot of content, it's like, wow, they probably need a prompt because they're actually interested in who we are and what we do. They need a prompt in the right direction because it looks like they care about us. So let's give a certain message to those people. And a lot of this can be done with custom audiences. But like I say, like, if you're looking at that stuff, that's pretty advanced, like, social media marketing strategy, right? A lot of people aren't going that deep into it. It's good. Cool. Yeah. Is the idea of social media um, to point people at your web page? You can, right? So that's like that is one reason why you might use social. Um, I try to look at social as less of a funnel. So it is, it is, it can be used as a funnel, right? It's like there's a whole lot of people there. My website has a call, a call to action, or it has a purchase path, or it has an email opt-in form. I want to collect those details and, and be able to communicate with them one on one. Social can be used for that, but the challenge with that is that if all you're doing is posting content saying go to my stuff, it's like it's kind of doesn't really stick right people aren't going to hang around so a lot of it is like and, and unfortunately a lot of the traditional social media marketing is really around how do I build a community on something like Twitter or Instagram or somewhere else and then like build the relationship with them or get them to actually care about us over time it doesn't happen overnight that's another unfortunate thing about social is unless you've got a lot of money to throw at it it takes time um, but then over time like build them to the point where they're loyal raving fans and then when you do present an offer to them you see spikes in, in your traffic, right? That's something that we've, we've seen a lot of. Um, I'll give a quick example of a way that we did a, built a direct social strategy for a client um, because it's probably a little bit relevant. Um, iPhone application allows you to pay for drinks at the bar when, you, when you're going through and you can literally like open it on your phone and your credit card details are already in there and it's a simple, easy way to go order, order your drinks but just literally at the end of the night walk out and it just, just stuck and it's, it's simple, easy, nice. Um, and they came to us and they were like, we want to build the Facebook page for our brand name. And we were like, yeah, I don't think anyone's going to care about your brand name. You've got a cool message but I don't know if anyone's going to care. So what we did was we went and built a Facebook presence. Literally the page was called We Love Beer. 
and we built a Facebook presence around an emotive, feeling-based page, how much more likely is an 18 to 30-year-old male going to like the We Love Beer page than a corporate brand they've never heard of before? I can tell you they're a lot more likely. So we built a, a, much, more, like a, a much bigger audience, and then what we did was we would go to those, that group of people, and we would go every like, week, it was every couple of weeks, we would go to them with a piece of content about the iPhone app. Right? So there was no brand all over the page, but we'd go with just every now and then, and they would see huge spikes in their download limits in the download, download limits in the download stats based on like the fact that we'd just gone to a big audience an engaged audience who were getting value call it value use the term loosely it was like emotive feeling happy stuff about beer um, just interesting memes and whatever um, but they would seeing spikes it was like that's an example of where it is actually an effective strategy but we couldn't have done that without having the audience first or the community first so so what do you think about email campaigns Oh, massive. You can't, like, I think emails are, email is probably still the single best way to engage an audience. The challenge with email right now is that open rates are dropping dramatically over the past, you know, five to ten years, right? If you look back at email marketing going back ten years ago, open rates were astronomically high, right? Because people weren't getting spammed, whereas over the past few years, they've dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. So I would, I, we, still, we use email. In, in, our, in, a, in a digital marketing agency where we focus primarily on social, we still use email marketing tactics to re-engage old leads constantly and it's not like blowing our minds in terms of success right if it was we probably wouldn't be doing this we'd be doing that um, but it is definitely a fundamental part of any digital strategy that's probably another thing to say is that so social isn't like to me it's not all or nothing with social social is one one platform one tool one way to do this i just like it for personal brand especially because it scales far beyond what you get with your billboard that you put down outside Another um, uh, conversation I heard today actually on the radio, which is quite topical, was um, talk about Facebook boosts. <coughs> and the chap mentioned that um, he was getting a, a very small return on, I don't know, five, six thousand or less likes uh, for a bit of, bit of um, a publication. But then he, uh, Facebook then popped up and said, hey, um, uh, here's some options to buy. $46 could buy you between six and 16,000 more, more, more connections. But $86 you can get between blah and blah. Um, so I heard about that for the first time today, and that's got some, mm. some thoughts on, on mm. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's targeted advertising, right? So it's I put out a piece of content, and knowing that only six to thirty percent of my audience is going to see it at generally a maximum, um, that's a real challenge, right? It's like okay, so now people aren't paying attention, or they can't see it, or whatever. Facebook are limited that. Facebook now go well. Actually, if you tell us who you want to reach for a very small amount of money, and it started just five dollar blocks, we'll essentially boost it to more people in your target demographic. So we'll make sure they see it in their news feed. And it's not obviously it's like it's just a way to get it in front of eyes. It's not necessarily giving you a, convert a convertible lead, but it's another way to get in front of more eyes. So this is something they've done for quite a while, and um, it's just an interesting way of you can do it sort of on a case by case basis, or throw a little bit of money here or there, and know for, with some with some certainty that your content is going to be seen by a much larger audience. And, and potentially a more targeted audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it comes down to how you choose to target it, right? So I could literally go. I want to. I mean, this is the reality, which is interesting. Is I could target an ad to. Um, Pick a, pick a demographic, males who are 40 to 43 years of age, or you know, 40 to 41 years of age, and then literally have in the copy of my ad, literally the message being like, are you turning 41 this year? Like, this is important. You know, like this, you could actually do that, and you could do that with, with that approach. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. well, I think even today it's fair to say that people are expecting targeted advertising in the way that don't just tell me if, if you don't know anything about me, because you're wasting my time and I won't open this, this bit of social media. Mm. So it's almost respecting the fact that you know, right. and, and, and you, you know more about me than I perhaps I, I would like you to. Pri privacy versus personalization. This is like the biggest debate going on right now in the digital space. It's like, would people rather, right? And you look at different age demographics having different thoughts here, but would people rather know that their life is private and know that people you know, can't, know, can't know these things about me or would they rather a personalised experience? Because my personal take on this, and this is a bit controversial, is that if you're going to advertise to me anyway, if it's something that I, if it's, if it's relevant, at least that adds value. I can tell you that I have actually clicked on an ad on Facebook and bought product as a result. So that was a, an ad that was a timely ad, it was relevant, it may have been remarketed to me based on something else I searched for, but it's, it's interesting, whereas I know that my dad, as an example, like, would have the total opposite view. He'd go like, no, they shouldn't be able to target me specifically. But, and this is something to remember with, with social, is that 
even when I target an ad to a specific audience, I can't see who you are. I just know that you're going to have the following sort of, you know, I, I can set the, the requirements around who the ad is seen by. So I know that it's going to be seen by males in this age demographic, in this area. I'm not getting your email address, right? And I suppose that's a, a big differentiator. Mm. So. And it might also reflect the, um, the, what the supermarkets and what the other banks know about us from our history, so too. Mm. So I had sort of a current affair all over our shows a few weeks back and they actually knew that if people bought this sort of product and this sort of time frame, then they're safer drivers, therefore they get marketed with insurance um, as a higher um, probability of buying, as opposed to the beer product at, at a certain other time, late at night, they're, they're on the, the X list for, uh, for insurance because you're a higher right. risk, therefore we don't want to sell to you. And mm. want people to transfer from their existing insurers. So There's, similar. Yeah, I, I just, just a sort of tidbit, some of you may have heard of this. Um, so Target in the US knew, were capturing so much information about people's purchasing behaviour that um, one day randomly this, this sort of young lady, Scott, have you heard of this, you know where I'm going? Yeah, so she literally like started receiving literally physical brochures in the mail um, with like, like nappies, like baby nappies and like baby products. And um, Target knew she was pregnant before she knew she was pregnant because of what she was buying in store and her behaviour going in and out of the store using their loyalty card. So that was interesting. Mm, I think they had some complaints from her parents, didn't they? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty scary thought. Right. But, and that's, that's using traditional, traditional marketing, right? That's not even using social data, where there's, you're actually giving them a whole lot more about you. And, you know, like I've, I've said a few times, like if my telco and my bank put all the data that they know about me together, that's pretty scary. Like they know, they know what I buy, who I buy it with, how frequently I buy it, they know everything. So it's like, man, overlay that with social data and I can sell anything to anyone. That's crazy. Any final awesome. questions? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. So um, with LinkedIn, the biggest thing is um, like populate your profile, right? So like add enough information in your profile that if someone is searching for related keywords, they're going to find you. That's, a, that's the first thing that like most people don't do is they don't have the right content in their profile, right? They don't use the bio pay, the bio section on their profile. Or they don't add any information about what they did in different roles. If you do that, and it, it doesn't necessarily look like you're trying to get headhunted, right? It's just a really simple way. Like, people generally have quite a lot of information on their LinkedIn profiles, right? I, 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 I'm pretty sure you do. I know I do, right? I do add content there about what I did and how I did it and when I did it because that's useful information. And if someone who's looking at engaging us and they can see that, you know, they're a tech startup and they can see that I was working in Silicon Valley, that's a really, that's a great conversation starter for me when I meet them to be chatting about the fact that I've done this and they've done that and they already know that before we even talk. So that's at, at a very basic level, it's make sure you get the right content in there. Um, I mentioned LinkedIn blogging. So LinkedIn previously had their influencer network, which you guys might have seen. You know, you, you probably saw in your feed Richard Branson wrote a new blog post and that would have appeared. Um, more recently, they've rolled that functionality out to everyone. So anyone, well, I think just about any, everyone. So now just about anyone can write their own blog articles within LinkedIn. And like I said, the beauty of this is that when you do that, every single person that you're connected to gets a little notification saying, Matt wrote, published an, a post and the title of the post. Um, if I had previously posted a blog article just in my LinkedIn feed, I know that I would have generated 10 clicks on it. But I know that a lot more people are seeing that because it's being read by hundreds of people and I can see that in the stats on the profile. So that's a really, really easy way to talk to your existing network about what you're doing, what you care about, what you see, what you think, all that stuff. So that's another basic one that I would do just to demonstrate a bit of thought leadership in your space. To build a big audience, it just takes time. It takes content, right? Like I said, unless you want to throw a lot of money at it and get your content in front of everyone, which you can do, but you can also go broke doing it. Um, I think um, it's just time and, and, and be always being on it, always be thinking about what, what else I can publish. And yet that's another question there is, I suppose, is um, I'll ask myself a question, is in terms of like frequency of posting, uh, one of the guys in our office posts on LinkedIn six times a day. Right? I think that probably gets to the point where that's probably being a bit annoying. Um, but no one's unfollowed, no one's criticised it. And the only thing that anyone has ever said to him when I've been with him is it was literally something to the effect of, man, I keep seeing your stuff. Like you're doing some really interesting things. Now behind the doors, they're probably like, I hate this guy, stop <laughs> spamming me. But no one's, un no one's unconnected, right? No one's blocked him. So um, I wouldn't do that much, but I certainly wouldn't be afraid to post a couple of times a week, put it that way. Right. 
Fair call. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I personally accept most people um, on LinkedIn, especially if they're local in Brisbane, but I'm probably on the side of being very social, right? Um, if someone adds me on LinkedIn, especially if they've written a custom note in the invitation request, I don't know if you guys are the same as this, right? If they haven't written a, a note in there, it, they may well have just gone through a list and hit connect, 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 connect. In which case, they're probably not someone that I really need to connect with. But in most cases, if they're local, I'll accept it. And the first thing I do is I shoot them back a note immediately and say, hey, thanks for connecting. Anything I can help you with? Literally, I think I, even, I might have done that with you, right? I literally, anyone who connects with me, I'll go like, how can I add value? And it's not me trying to sell something necessarily. It's me going like, thanks. Is there anything, did you have, is there, was there a purpose for adding me? Some people go the other way and they go, I only add people who I've met or who I've worked with. Um, on Facebook, I would say it's probably a much safer way of working is only adding people you actually know in person or, you know, you know them pretty well, right? Um, but it comes in a personal preference. There's no reason why, I don't believe there's any reason why you shouldn't do it, except that you've got this, now you've got people posting stuff that you probably don't care about because they're in some other country and they just spammed everyone to get their 500 plus connections. So, and which does happen, so yeah.